Welcome to Wizards of the Tower. Roleplay. In this episode, Campaign Tales, episode 8. Wizards of the Tower. Role play. I'm Delaney. And I'm Tom. And this is Campaign Tales. This is our eighth episode. Yeah. And we're going to start filling in on the dates on this. Now, in my realm, I actually have my own calendar. Yeah. And the uh, the month is called Budding Fen, which is actually short for May. And you kind of figure out but where did you come up with that title? Because it's interesting because each of Delaney's months have like really, any really interesting sort of uh, natural names and natural cycle names, like you know harvesting or growing or something like that. So where did you come up with budding? Fen? You actually came up with the name of budding fen. I said, well, what of it? What kind of a name do we want to come up with? May and May being the time of the year when plants are starting to bud. Yeah. You said budding fan, and I'm like, I like that. Wow, I don't remember that at all. Yeah. In my realm, I actually try to get a little bit of input for some of my players, and Tom's gotten a little bit uh, more than most, because being my husband and he lives with me, and yeah. I ask for his input, he gives me thoughts and input into that. But yeah. budding fin, which is May, and meaning the, uh, the sprouting of the buds mm -hmm. of plants, the plants are starting to bloom, and producing whatever they produce. However, in this campaign that we're in, the Wildlander campaign, there are no plants producing in the spring. This is the time of endless winter. Right. So even though at this time period people would be expecting the sun to start warming up and melting all the snow and the plants to start pushing up through the snow, it's not happening. It's been like winter. It's just been snowing it's, more and yeah. more and more. It's endless winter. Right. And the generic name for this campaign is the Never Ending Winter. Never Ending Winter, right. And that's because winter has not come to an end. And there's a reason for that. That yeah. the, the party is trying to figure out why has this apocalyptic winter set upon their lands and their people yeah. knowing that, the, that they're going to starve to death and, and uh, run out of honey to make their meads and make their ales and wines and Everything. food and All animals. Resources. Animals can't be fed because yeah. they have no food and what little bit they have they're they're rationing and they're going out hunting what animals they can and the animals are even not around anymore. The animals yeah. are becoming harder and harder to find because yeah. the animals know it's winter and they can't survive so they're they're headed to locations where they can find food. Yeah, it's a it's a time definitely a time of troubles and a time of resource scarcity. Right. So, the date that we're going to pick up on, we never mentioned the dates in the other uh, Campaign Tales, but we're going to start doing that. So, yeah. when we pick up on this uh, Campaign Tales, it's the 25th of Budding Fen, yeah. or basically May. Yeah. And we had just had the battle with the bugbears. Right. And we had encountered uh, what we, as players, think is a death knight. Now, of course, that's the DM's decision about what the creature really is. It's a draugr. Now, uh, what is a draugr? Well, um, it's a kind of a generic name for an undead warrior. And what I always get draugr from is it's a Norse idea of an undead warrior. And I always get it from Skyrim uh, because the restless draugr inside the tombs and the barrows. Yeah. Um, and it, and it fits because this is sort of a Skyrimish sort of world. And if anybody's ever played Skyrim, you you know you kind of have the idea that when you're up by Winterhold and it's always snowy and everything like that. Well, that's kind of like you know where we're at. You know, or by by Dawnstar, you know, or somewhere up north along the coast, it's just always cold. Um, so we decide to leave the Death Knight alone, and it marches itself you know right out of the valley, right past us. Uh, it's kind of one of those really fortuitous decisions that you make as a group that you're not going to try to attack the Death Knight. However, in the past, we've had people in our group who would have ran mm -hmm. over and tried to grapple the Death Knight or pick its pocket or something like or that fought and, it or, or fought it and end up getting killed. Luckily, our group right now isn't the type of group that's going to do that. There isn't a whole bunch of foolhardy people in it. 
So uh, what yeah. happened though is that the hunters had been eaten by the bugbears, and we gather up a few of their possessions, and we decide to construct a funeral pier, and uh, our cleric, you know, says the rights because at this time, of course, uh, we're missing our cleric of Morte. Of Morte. Uh, the cleric just didn't make it up. And so we have um, our other cleric, and she says the, the funerary rites over these hunters, and that takes place during the 25th of Budding Fen. And, of course, on the next day, the 26th, is we're going to continue on our journey. Now, a little bit about the, the, the drugger, kind of throw it back here a little bit. Sure. Um, when it starts walking towards the party, the party Scatters. <laughs> basically just steps out of the way like... like yeah. uh, like the Red Sea parting from yeah, Moses, it's, it's part, and yeah. it, it just it kind of looks at him, and it's glowing blue eyes, and it's glowing, yeah. it's a glowing blue skeleton with rusty armor, and it's got this magical glowing dagger, and, yeah. and they part ways, just part, and the drugger kind of looks at him, and basically challenging him, and if nobody challenges it, it just walks off into the snowstorm. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like. One of those things where just about everybody makes a collective decision right away not to pick a fight with this thing. And we have no idea what level it is. Which is kind of an amazing thing because they're dwarf who, uh, their trait is they go berserk. And it's not like the raging berserk. They actually, it's more like the old... Not the uh, dwarf. Not the dwarf, excuse it's me. The, the barbarian. barbarian. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Yes. Um, has this trait where they rage. And it's not like the raging dwarf, or raging barbarians and... and D and D or Pathfinder, it's actually a trait yeah. that, that is like the old throwback to Norse or Viking, where the the berserk or berserker, yeah. where something stressful happens and they just go nuts, and they actually make their roll, yeah, because they yeah. make her make a a, a a will save, yeah, and that's one of her lowest rolls, and she actually made a roll and did thankfully not attack, yeah, thankfully she made her her will save on that because I'm sure we could have fought it. I don't know if we would have survived. We had just already fought the bugbears. And we were down spells and down healing potions and mm -hmm. everything else. And it's kind of one of those things where it probably wouldn't have been a TPK, but it would have come close to being one. Yeah. So I'm glad it didn't happen. And in uh, the 26th uh, Budding Finn, the party basically just travels following a yeah. frozen uh, river in the deep yeah. snow, hunting along the way, trying to gather up enough food uh, to, to supplement what they need to eat. Now, I have rules that I came up with for our realm that Tom, who's the main hunter, or My character, yeah. Maud, Maud, and Maud has to roll... At the start, it was it was easier, but it's becoming harder and harder. Yeah, it is. So, Maud needed to make, initially, a 16 hunting score for f just food for herself. Mm -hmm. And then, for every two points after that, Mod could feed one more person. Yeah. Now their bear actually requires two, mm -hmm. so enough for two people. Yeah. So at this point, I think the roll actually had got up to an eighteen. It's it's at eighteen. Yeah, now. at eighteen, and pretty soon have, it's going to be twenty. When you have nine nine party members, yeah, that's a lot of food. You got you got to roll in the thirties, and yeah. that's you know with people helping. Yeah. And Assisting. in the adventure, people can only do one thing. At the you know for the day they can yeah. either make their potion and gather the herbs or they can make a fire or make the shelter or they can go hunt. So yeah. in many instances you've got three or four people at the party going out hunting. Sometimes a little bit more. Yeah. And then you know with Pathfinder rules, if they make their success of ten or higher, then Tom's mod character gets to add two more points. Yeah. And so when you need thirty points plus. Well, there's been many days now where we haven't got enough food to successfully feed our entire party. Right. So they're almost like on half rations. Uh, so it's kind of a feast or famine sort of thing. And one of the reasons why we're sticking close to the river, as this you know river kind of meanders down this big valley, we're traveling along it like this. You know, the valley's really steep coming down. The river goes up like this. We're traveling higher and higher in the mountains. You know, of course, as you're following the course of a river going up the river, mm -hmm. it's flowing down. So you're traveling higher in elevation. Um, you know, we're traveling along the side of the river, moving along. One of the things we're doing, of course, is ice fishing. We're chopping holes in the ice and trying to fish. And that's supplementing a lot of our game. Uh, yeah, some hunting. of your food that you need. So we'll take part of a day when we when we mm -hmm. set up camp. We'll go out to the river, chop a hole in the ice, and fish. 
Luckily, a lot of us have fishing skills, and we've got fishing line and stuff, and we're able to pull up, uh, you know, some fish. And the fish helps with meals. Um, without that, we'd be starving to death. And yeah. so, you know, typically that's what we're doing on the 26th and the 27th of Budding Fen is we're just traveling up this valley, uh, trying to head up to uh, this area where we know there's another set of standing stones. And that those standing stones, I think, are going to be in Shadowcat land, right? No, they're right in the verge of, right of on, Holly's right Staff, but close to Shadow, okay. the Snowcat. The Snowcat, sorry, snow I keep cat. saying Shadowcat, yeah. but it's the Snowcat land. Right. Okay. And, of course, you know, being next to the river and snow, they've got endless supplies of water, so that's yeah, not, water's not, that's not a big big deal for them, yeah. but the food is the issue. Yeah. And then they don't have anything happen to them on the 27th of Budding Fen, and then the 28th, they actually are moving along and they get jumped by a big giant owlbear. Yeah. And now, it charges right out of the forest, right at us. It's just, it's just enraged and it it's hungry. <laughs> it's hungry and it wants us. And it wants our bear, it wants us, it wants everything. So Now, an owlbear in my realm is not a natural creature. Of course, it's not a natural creature really in, in any yeah. RPG. It's a, a creature of magical construction. Yeah. In my world, owlbears never existed. Owlbears came upon in the time of chaos, mm -hmm. which was an adventure that happened 95 years previous yeah. to where the party is at, which Tom was a, a party member in that original campaign. My cleric was in that original yeah. campaign. And so you know what an owlbear is. It's basically a, a giant bear with feathers and uh, an, uh, with an owl head and claws, and it's just ferocious. It's mean as can be and, yeah. and quite deadly. And this one was a little bit bigger than a normal owlbear. Ferocious is a new word we've come up with. It's a combination of voracious, meaning hungry, and ferocious. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, and owlbears are what we consider to be evil constructs created by you know a wizard or chaos, or, or chaos magic by a wizard uh, let loose upon the world to cause all sorts of damage and destruction to people and things and, and uh, animals and what have you. And of course this one charges right at us, attacks us without any warning, attacks our bear, Sophie, uh, really hurts her badly, uh, almost kills her, and my character Maud blows a hero point to actually uh, save her. Now hero points in Pathfinder are an optional rule that we, we play with. Yeah. Players can have up to three hero points, and th hero points can be used to change a die roll, or if you have a lot a, enough of them, if you die, you can actually stabilize. Yeah. Now, there, I know there are people out there that don't believe in that. I actually give it as an option. It's kind of the gods inter intervening mm -hmm. that you've done something, yeah. and that's why they've, you know, you've got them. So yeah. you can use them to save your life or to change a die roll. And their oracle, Rolf, actually goes up to try and help the party member and get saved, and he he, he basically gets obliterated. Yeah. Um, he ends up dying, but we find out why later on that he comes back. And Yeah, he actually he actually doesn't die. He, they yeah. think he's dead, and they're like, oh, no, Rolf. And he's like, oh, I'm still here. He's like, oh, what? That was yeah. horrible. Yeah. Oh, that hurt. Yeah, he comes back, and, of course, we find out later on why he does. But Which we'll explain here in just a little bit. Yeah, we'll explain... But he comes back and he's kind of, uh, things happen to him now, all of a sudden. Uh, yeah. The chaos magic starts to take hold of his body. Remember, you know, we've, we're experiencing chaos magic. We had the chaos magic earlier that we were encountered. Uh, it takes hold of his body and does some strange things to him. Yeah, so Rolf, if you touch him, he's actually really, really, really cold and you'll take cold damage. Yeah. Now, uh, later, on, later on, that actually doesn't happen. He learns to start controlling it. Yeah. But at first, if you go up and touch him, that even means healing him, you'll take lethal cold damage from him. And he can do cold damage to other other things and cone cone effects. He hasn't done any of that to anybody yet because he can never quite catch anybody without catching him in a cone of effect and catching his party member. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem with using area of effect spells. Right. You know, a lot of times you get your own party members in there. But some of the things that start happening is when they start casting our... Uh, uh, divine spells on him, mm -hmm. he actually gets really tiny, and he's like, Where, where'd he go? And he's like, I'm down here, I'm down here, oh, 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 oh. you know, and he's really tiny, and then all of a sudden he's really big, and he's as Huge. big as a giant. He's as big as a giant. And everyone's like, holy holy cow, what's going on with, with Wolf? Yeah. Or he starts 
uh, displacing or blinking. Yeah, blinks he's in and here, out of existence. He's there, or he's just boop, boop, boop. He's like a flashing yeah. light, you know, yeah. coming off and on and off and on, and, and they, they can't figure out what's going on with him. Yeah, it's all this instances of, as you're a magic user, and you draw from the ether for your, you know, for your magic, well, there's chaos magic existing in the world. If you can imagine, you know, you've got the currents of magic kind of moving through the world like this, and as a magic user, you draw from those currents like a river. Next to it is chaos magic, which looks like forks of lightning or something like that. And as you draw into that, you don't know what you're going to get. Anything can happen. And that kind of chaos magic can infect the normal course of the regular magic. And so when you're casting spells, you know, you may displace yourself, or you may grow big, or you may do something to somebody else. Now normally, wild magic only affects arcane. In, in Rolf's case, arcane magic affects him. Mm -hmm. So weird things happen if they cast arcane, or not arcane, but uh, divine, yeah, divine, magic. divine magic on him. And that is any divine magic that includes him. Yeah. And weird things happen to him. Strange. Yeah. So the party skins the owl there, and they figure they can use that, and they bed down for the night. Yeah. And in the middle of the night, something bad happens. Yeah. Well, we're just barely recovering from the owl bear attack, you know. And uh, that night, uh, the random monster encounter turns out to be something rather uh, deadly and uh, really uh, destructive to our party. Yeah, it's a, it's a remoras, or kind of like an ice centipede. A giant ice centipede. Yeah, bursts out of the snow and, yeah. and uh, attacks the party. Now, a remoras is a very, very deadly creature. It's actually higher CR than what the party could handle, but it's a random monster. Yeah. And uh, it's, in, it's, in, in yeah. my world, random monsters may not always be CR-based, you know, so I'm not going to always just throw... A, you know, lesser or, or equal to or even slightly higher, you may run into something that, that can outright kill you. Yeah. Uh, the remoras is bad. It, gra it grapples, it bites on people, it, it does, can swallow them. It, it does, does burn damage. It does poison. Is it poison damage? No, it's burn damage. Burn damage, okay. So it does, like, acid blood damage to people, and uh, it catches Maud sleeping and grapples her. And essentially... <laughs> almost swallows Essentially her. almost swallows her. Now... Luckily, I hadn't used, my character hadn't used any hero points up until trying to save Sophie with one hero point. So my character had three total hero points. That's as many as you can have. You can't have Unless you have a specific feat within Pathfinder, yeah. which can allow you to have five. And I don't have that feat. I don't have that feat. It's just, it's just a fighter. I don't have that feat. So uh, I blow another two hero points to try to get out of that situation, basically to stabilize. Otherwise, my character mod would have been dead. Yeah. Remember, Mono almost got swallowed. Yeah, remember, <laughs> if a, and if a more swallows you, it's really bad news because the fire damage in you is. I think it does a, a bunch of d sixes, like sixty six or, or yeah. nine. Or, I can't quite remember. I'll have to. I'll put it up down there. How much uh, d six damage it can do in fire damage? Now uh, remember, folks, DMs don't kill players. Players <laughs> kill players. So I say that <laughs> with a bit of irony. Um, so. Uh, but but we, you didn't die, did you? I didn't die. Okay. Uh, we do manage to get out of that. And kill the, that, kill the creature. Yeah, we do manage to get out of that predicament and kill the remorse. I think maybe it had a lot to do with Frostolf and his sword, yeah. if I remember right. He yeah. came up and started hacking on it. And, and probably you too. sorry too, with her sword uh, hacking on it. And finally they just hacked it into pieces. Now, our dwarf, Karnak, uh, being the learned person, the learned scholar that he is, and a magic user, tries to harvest some of that fire blood. I got a, some of that fire blood in a flask or two. I don't know what he thought he was going to do with it. I think he used it later on in something. Okay. He tried to, to use it for something. Uh, started to you know, experiment with potion making or magic making or something. Anyway, it, it's considered, I guess their Moore's blood is considered, you know, kind of a component for making yeah, potions. Alchemical. Yeah, an alchemical component. So. Well, for a acid or, or burning or... Yeah. or you know, and I allowed him to harvest a little bit because they did have some, some things, and sure. you know, use it for later on if they wanted to. Yeah, and Delaney lets, lets people do that. Use resources, you know, to uh, within reason. Within reason, you know, take the blood or take the tooth of this or the claws of this and make something from it. And another thing, of course, we like to do, and and I I always bring this up when after we're done in a fight, especially with archers is Delaney lets us roll to see how many arrows we can recover. 
because you don't have an endless quiver. No. Nope. You know, you've got a quiver with 20 or 30 arrows, maybe 25 arrows in there. You use five or six or more, especially if you have multi-shot. You know, you use that during a fight, you got to get those arrows back or, or else you're going to run out of arrows. Yeah, whether you miss or an arrow may have a, hit a bone and break. And you know, break arrows yeah. aren't aren't perfect. They're not even even modern arrows which are aluminum can can be damaged. Oh yeah, they can be you damaged, know, be they bent, can be broken, and, bent, yeah, yeah, cracked, whatever. Yeah. So then we do that. Uh, we try to recover that night. Uh, that's the thirtieth, uh, and then the next day, the thirty fifth, thirty first, thirty first. Sorry. Uh, we travel farther and we encounter something else. Yeah, they come across this tree. Now, this was a random encounter that I I have a chart in mind, and I have these decks of cards that I've gotten off of Kickstarters and, and other things. And I have the party roll the dice for which deck we use, and then I have them roll, and the lowest person, the person who rolls the lowest number, is the one who's fated Draws to the card. draw the card. And this card was a tree that ha basically was chaos magic. Mm -hmm. And it was described as this old, um, dead-looking tree with carvings in it and standing stones. Small standing stones. Yeah, a lot smaller than these. A lot smaller. But, like, but still like, a ring around it. Like three feet, four feet tall at, yeah. at biggest. With carvings. And the tree mm -hmm. even has carding, carvings. And the tree has yeah. fetishes. Now, fetishes... Those who don't know could be bones, could be ribbons, ribbons pieces of cloth, ribbons of cloth, yeah, uh, rope, just rusty things in them, yeah, just all sorts of things hanging in the tree. It's kind of the Nordic sort of Celtic belief that they would adorn trees with ribbons, you know, the the May tree or whatever. Uh, they did adorn it with ribbons, pieces of cloth, something to bring light and cheer, and you know, to a to a kind of a world that's just waking up in the spring, and like the maypole, or to uh, you know to you almost like you fetishize a tree by making it something other than it is a magical object by an adorning altar. it. Yeah. yeah, an altar or like adorning the tree, or the or a natural object like a rock by uh, doing something to it to uh, uh, to enhance its its uh, its its image. Now the party ends up actually having two encounters with this tree. One's going in at this point, and then another time, which we'll talk about later, when they're leaving mm -hmm. this, the area, they come across it, yep. but they come, come across it at night this time, yeah. and something a little bit different happens. Yeah. But the tree is chaos. It's, it's loaded full of chaos magic, and touching it does like a thousand different things. Yeah, and remember when I was talking about before about the natural currents of magic in the real world, you know, it's like this river flowing, and then chaos magic would be like jagged forks of lightning. Well, at the one of the places where the lightning would, would fork or where it would strike, that's where the tree exists. And it coexists at the same plane as the natural magic and chaos magic. It's like a confluence of the two, and that's where the tree exists. And some people are drawn to it. Some of the magic yeah. users in our group are just... You're just, well, you know, they just uncontrollably drawn to it. We're sorry, the barbarian actually is the first, and she goes up and touches it, and then takes a step, and all of a sudden she's 30 feet away. She just yeah. leaps. Yeah. It's like she took a step, and all of a sudden she just leaps 30 feet, yeah. and she goes nuts. She's like, what's going on here? And yeah. she's she's all stressed out and trying to, who did this to me, and what's yeah. going on? Well, she rages, but there's nothing to rage against. Yeah. I think she goes and bangs on one of the stones with her sword or something yeah. ridiculous like that. Uh, she's got nothing to rage against. There's no enemy, you know. Um... I think um, Maud touches one of the stones, I think. Not the tree necessarily, but touches one of the stones and loses one coin. One gold coin. Yeah, doesn't realize it. But doesn't realize one, it. One gold coin disappears yeah, from it's just, Maud's pouch. You know, it's just one of those totally random, one of a thousand things that could possibly happen. Yeah. Now, other people touch it and different things happen to them. Well, you. Uh, this is at the time you actually go up and touch Rolf oh. and discover your, Rolf was going to touch it and you grab him to prevent him. That's from right. Doing it. That's right. I prevent him. Try to or Maud tries to prevent him from touching it, and she takes uh, seven points of cold damage, lethal cold damage. Yeah. You know, which just you could imagine just being chilled to the bone, or you know, cold. You know, creeping up your arms and freezing you like that, and just realizing that man, you just can't touch this guy. He's deadly. Well, they've kind of known it before, but you know, you really now realize really knows it, now. it that he's emulating cold. Yeah. 
uh, their dwarf kind of a, this is now this was a fun one yeah because their dwarf goes up and ends up touching it and becomes claustrophobic oh. now the dwarf doesn't know this because we never got to yeah uh, to do anything yet with the dwarf to have them go into some place but it's just interesting that that uh, Kara who's playing Kardak the dwarf <laughs> is now going to have to play it as a claustrophobic dwarf yeah. I mean, if you imagine, imagine a dwarf, yeah, dwarfs. You know, they're underground. They're in dungeons. They have you know special dungeoneering. You have dwarven sense, and all of a sudden he's claustrophobic and he can't go underground. What's a dwarf to do? Yeah, and then Rolf does end up eventually touching the tree, and at this point there's a revolution, revelation, not yeah. a revolution, a revelation yeah. that scatters within every party member and yeah. anybody who is an ally. Of Rolf, mm -hmm. within forty eight hours yeah. of of them seeing Rolf or becoming an ally to Rolf, they know that he is the son of Invernia, who is the goddess of winter. Yeah, it's sort of like a psychic blast that emanates from the tree outward, and it affects all of us in the group. Now we've suspected different things, you know, through the different you know adventures we've had. We've suspected that he's been connected to Invernia in some way or another. And Invernia is the goddess of winter, who, if you remember, is Morte's daughter. Uh, but we, we all experience this at the same time. I'll post the picture of Invernia up, up in the, the yeah. corner here. When we get this psychic blast that hits us all at once, and all of a sudden it's revealed to us in this powerful revelation, oh, now we realize he truly is the bastard son of Invernia. Right. We he's know this now. We know that he's a demigod, and we know this through our core, just as we know anything, we know who and what he is. Or is he? Well, it's a revelation. It's a revelation that the tree gives them. It could be a lie. We don't know. Now, but now Rolf will, will deny it. He still denies it to true, this very day. True. But the reason he's denying it, of course, is because he has, you know, he has his actual human parents. His mother and father. His father who disowned him for his supposed cowardice. But then also his mother, who or the woman who he's believed to, who's have, raised him, who's raised him and been his mother all this time. Uh, you know, he doesn't want to throw that whole idea of her being his mother away. It's kind of like when you, you know, you, you know, that old story of the of the prince being raised by the paupers. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the mother who took care of you, and all of a sudden it's revealed. Well, I gave him to you when you when he was a babe, and you took care of him all this time. But your real mother is Queen This. And he's like, oh my God, I'm the I'm the prince of this area, and and but I was raised by peasants, and so it's kind of that old story, but it has a it has a really a really powerful significance when you consider the fact that we're in a never ending winter, and, and people are blaming and people are blaming him, blaming, and blaming Invernia. Invernia, but will the blame go from Invernia onto him when they realize, and people will realize when they meet him that he is Invernia's son, yeah. So it's quite the, quite the revolution, revelation, revelation, <laughs> revolution, it's, yeah, revolution. It's revolution. quite a conundrum, mm, yeah, uh, conundrum as as a as a group. You know what to do about this, and so that's going to be part of what we'll have to deal with. You know, farther down the road. And a lot of times when when Rolf is uh, you know with them, he he sits as close as he can to the fire, and he's kind of a loner. He doesn't he don't say things. You know, they ask, and he's he's like like we've talked. He's smart as can be, but yeah. He uh. You know, he he sits a lot and thinks about all this, and he doesn't want to admit it. So with that, that's uh, Wizard of the Tower. Campaign Tales. And we'll be back with another episode here soon. So keep watching, like, share, and subscribe. And may all your adventures be epic, and keep on role-playing. Thanks, folks.